Good evening. My name is David Goodwin, and I am the Assistant Director at the Fordham University Center on Religion and Culture. Many thanks for joining us tonight for our fourth Duffy Fellows event and our first play, Fifth Cup. This past academic year, the Center on Religion and Culture welcomed five current Fordham students or recent graduates as our inaugural Duffy Fellows. These fellows undertook independent research and creative projects exploring the intersection between religion and public life. You can find the full calendar of Duffy Fellow events on our website. We'll share that link in a minute. The Duffy Fellows program was made possible thanks to a gift by the late James Duffy, a longtime friend of the CRC and Fordham University. This program demonstrates how your support might directly contribute to the CRC and its mission. If you enjoyed tonight's event, please consider making a gift, no matter how small. We'll be sharing a link for donations in the chat box in a moment. On Passover each year, four cups of wine are drunk throughout the Seder. A fifth is poured and left on an empty seat for Elijah, the prophet and herald of the Messiah. Fifth cup is a play in progress which explores the empty spaces existing in modern Jewish life. Somewhere, two people watch as the wise family sits down for a Passover dinner and Seder. But the evening sputters to a halt as one question comes to the fore. Who gets Elijah's cup when the night is over? Tonight, I'm excited to introduce Duffy fellow, India Darawetsky. India graduated summa cum laude with a concentration in theater performance from Fordham University. She will be appearing in a new comedy web series, Big Egg. This summer, India will be performing with the 2021 Hudson Valley Shakespeare Festival in a production of The Tempest. If you're planning a trip to the Hudson Valley, make sure to put that on your list. Now, a little housekeeping before we begin. In a moment, I'll turn over the stage to India and her cast. After the play, we'll take questions from you, our audience. Feel free to enter your comments and questions in the chat box. Please, be, please remember to be respectful to the performers and your fellow audience members. We are recording tonight and we'll be posting the video on our YouTube channel in a few days. With that, please join me in welcoming Duffy fellow, India Darawetsky. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for making time this evening to join us for this little Zoom reading. Uh, as David so kindly mentioned, my name is India Darawetsky. I graduated in 2020 with a concentration in theater performance from Fordham University. And the lovely cast that is joining me today is entirely composed of fellow Fordham Theater alum and current students. Uh, so I'll introduce them in just a bit, but first a little introduction of this piece. Um, about 15 months ago, I was sitting in my apartment, uh, plugging away at a assignment that I received from my religion and ecology course. Uh, it was a final project in which the aims were pretty similar to this grant uh, to sort of take an aspect of my own interests and to see how I could make that interest converse with a religious thing. Uh, so that sort of became a 20 page long script that was mostly just pseudo academic dialogue about the modern Jewish person's take on ecology and our own duty to as Jews sort of uh, act as stewards of the earth. And my professor took a look at it and said, hey, I think you might be good for this grant. Why don't you check it out? Uh, and now here, 15 months later, I have a cast of six people reading this play, which has gone through so many drafts. Um, it obviously started in a very different place. And even the introduction that David just read so kindly for you all, doesn't fully reflect the plot that you're going to be seeing tonight. So I'll give you a little overview of the plot just because I know that Zoom theater can be a little bit confusing. Uh, the family name is changed. We are watching two people from the past who sort of exist in Jewish lore, Pharaoh and Moses, who some of you may know from the classic film, um, 
I'm blanking on the classic film. It's animated. It's grand. Prince of Egypt. God bless. Prince of Egypt. That's the one. Um, <laughs> there's singing, there's dancing. There is no singing or dancing in this. But uh, Moses and Pharaoh are family, basically. And I was very interested in the echoes that we find in modern life of different biblical narratives. Obviously, we all have families that we have to contend with. Moses and Pharaoh are two siblings that come head to head quite a bit in the Torah, at least. Um, so I've decided to see how it would be to have them interact with a family in the modern day, the Waxman family, which is multi-generational. We have the grandmother, Ophir, played by Angelica Herrera, the father, Leo, played by Brendan Wallace Downey, Belle, the older daughter, played by Al Rosenberg, and Mira, the younger daughter, played by Eliza Poggle. Uh, Moses is going to be played by Amanda Morrow, and Pharaoh is going to be played by Pedro Gonzalez. Uh, Brendan will also be voicing Subway Man, which you can probably see right now. He is, he just pops in for a little bit. Um, so I think that's everything I want to tell you before we get started. So I'm going to switch over to narrator mode at this point uh, and rename myself accordingly. But the way this is gonna flow, I'm just gonna read you some notes. I'll read you the cast list again, just for a reminder, and then we'll get started. Thank you all so much for joining us. So the cast, the ghosts, Moses, male, any race, any age, Pharaoh's sibling, Pharaoh, any gender, any race, any age, Moses' brother. The Waxman family, Ophir, 70s, female, any race, Leo's mother-in-law, Leo, late 40s, male, any race, Belle's father, Belle, 26, female or non-binary, any race, Mira's sibling, Mira, 24, female, any race, Ophir's granddaughter. And the others are Subway Man, who is 20s to 30s, male, any race. A couple of notes before we get started. The stage direct, in the stage directions and by certain characters, Moses is referred to using they, them pronouns. By other characters, they are referred to using she, her, or he, him pronouns. None of this is meant to signify a gender identity for Moses, but meant to convey the way in which each character views Moses. So Moses' pronouns will shift in the stage directions depending upon the actor who portrays the role. And while the play is set in New York City, it could be set in any big city. Here we go. Act one, scene one. Lights up on a semi-fertile wasteland, Pharaoh lies in the middle of the stage. Don't mind me, boss. Don't mind me at all, boss. He gets up and starts taking seeds out of his pocket, which he scatters on the ground. Nothing here but me and time, boss. Nothing at all, boss. You don't mind if I call you boss, do you? Well, you won't tell me your name, boss. You won't tell anyone. So what else should I call you? Please don't like smite me for saying so, boss, but we, you and me, we're pretty alike. He stops and waits. He throws an arm across his eyes and looks up at the sky. Huh, we are. No names, just titles. We both have stuff to be in charge of. He gestures around at the empty stage. Ah, people. Must be nice though, boss, to not have any family. Not like me at all then, are you, boss? That's okay, I guess. Pharaoh starts swinging his arms back and forth. Little pellets fly out of his hands. Ah, barley. Fields and fields of barley. He begins to run up and down the stage, arms outstretched, touching imaginary barley. He kicks dirt over the seeds he's dropped. All there is in life is barley. Red barley, yellow barley, oats and beans and barley. Minus oats and beans. He flops on the ground again. I'm tired, Jared. I'm tired. Okay, shh. I'm napping. Pharaoh rolls around a bit on the ground and then starts humming. And you'll be 
In the world of pure imagination, if you want to view paradise, simply look around a little bit. Pharaoh looks up at the sky and flinches. A figure appears out of the dark. It's Moses, carrying a cup in one hand and a clipboard in the other. Moses stares down at the clipboard. What do you want? Charlie. Moses keeps staring at the clipboard. Huh? You're on Farley. Look, if, if you want some, you'll have to check in with. Uh... Pharaoh points at the sky. Suddenly, thunder claps. Moses lifts the cup above her head. A stream of liquid pours from above into the cup while rain echoes. As it pours into the cup, Moses chants quickly and quietly. <laughs> Moses wipes the rim of the glass and studies the contents. So dramatic. That whole boss thing. Cool hand Luke, right? Cool hand Luke, right? Just stopping along my way to drop off. To he slips the cup down gingerly. To see how you're doing. Kind of an evaluation. So. She flips through the papers on her clipboard. Why now? Just that time of year. Ah. Moses finds the page she was looking for and takes a pen out from behind her ear. Do you have any idea how long you've been in this position? 14 years? Mm. Is that close? No. Are you satisfied? Here? No. No. Moses checks a few things off on her clipboard. Mm, I think it would be a good idea for you to get out of the field for a while. I'll walk it up the ladder. Like you'll get a response. It's never changed. What hasn't? My purgatory chores. There is no purgatory. Now what the hell is this? You couldn't be doing the exact same thing every day. Absolutely I can. Pharaoh mimes the actions he describes. Every day I spread the seeds. If there are big rocks in the way, I <clears throat> pull them off to the side. When the seeds grow, I cut them down. When they're cut, I bundle them up. They disappear. I weed the land and start all over. I mean, how can that not be purgatory? Moses is looking back at the clipboard. You don't seem so good. Isn't that the point? Joke's on you guys. It's probably stripping the topsoil. No, it's your pretend year. You are pretending to do your little tasks. I am not. You aren't planting seeds, though. Are you trying to get me in trouble? I'm planting them, OK? I'm planting the seeds and loving every second of it. So mm, that isn't right. Moses shuffles through her clipboard. Don't tell me how to do my job. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year thou shalt be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Lo, tis Rasadeka, thou shalt never sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. You're kidding, right? All this is for nothing. I've been spreading the seeds, sweating onto these seeds for a year, hoping they grow so I won't get punished and they're not even supposed to be here. Moses looks over at the wine on the ground. Why are you staring at the wine? Are you trying to make it move? Who said anyone would punish you? Pharaoh changes. Hey. Pharaoh points at the cup. I bet you could make it move. Come on. I was kind of distracted when you did the ocean. Please. I'm so bored. I'm always so bored. I'm never going to get out of here. I'm never going to see anything amazing. Make it move for old time's sake. This is wine. So? So you know I'm not Jesus, right? Pharaoh starts nudging Moses. Well, you're both messiahs, right? Do it. Come on. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do no, it. I have a very important, do not spill this. Pharaoh takes Moses' free arm and makes Moses hit herself. Why are you hitting yourself? Why are you hitting yourself? Why are you hitting yourself? Pharaoh drops the arm. As Pharaoh speaks this monologue, he uses his chin in the crook of Moses's neck and shoulder to drive Moses down to the ground. Moses stays steady, holding the cup. I can wrestle for you for it. Come on, take me. Head's head like a man. What? What? Oh, little baby, little basket baby doesn't have what it takes to throw down like we used to. Come on. 
I'll fight you. And when you lose, you'll have to do your little magic trick and lead me into my exodus, right? Here's what we can do. I'll yank off my sandals and smack you in the chest. And then your great grand uncle can interpret all our dreams, mine and the snakes, because we need our Messiah too. Come and get me, Abe. Come and get me, Cain. Throw me in the dirt, yank me by the ankle, drag me to the base of Sinai and tell me I don't belong because I can't swim. You know, you want me dragged away like all my brothers, sisters, cousins, uncles, grandpas, firstborns, all the firstborns and the angel of death laughed when she carried them away in her arms. So you can at least make the wine move. Or does it remind you too much of the ram's blood and gray wings and tiny dead hands? Come on. Come on, move it. Make waves, make storms, take souls. Do as your Pharaoh commands. Pharaoh sits down. Pick them up. Today, Pharaoh stops. Doesn't seem like you're that upset. How would you know that? You don't know me. My people knew me, my friends and my family, and they're dead, so. I know you. I'm your people. No. But then what am I? A sneak. So I should apologize to them? Your people? Or... Pharaoh points up at the sky. Come on. No one's there. They're dead, and so is whatever is sitting up there and making me flop around in the dirt. You don't deserve a break. I didn't want to go with you anyway. Why would I want to be with you? Pick them up. Okay, I'm working on something time sensitive, so be done when I get back. Moses starts to exit. Thunder sounds. I like. I want to go. Moses is surprised to find herself say it, but. Okay. Scene two. Pharaoh and Moses appear on a nearly empty subway car. They're both in long robes that look like trench coats. Belle is sitting alone on the other end of the train car. Subway man stands near one of the doors with his back turned to the audience. You can't be here. How did you? How did you do that? How did you get here? Oh. <laughs> Moses sees Bell. Oh, is this real? Are we moving? Yes, sit down. I have to figure out how to get you back. How? No, I I'm staying. I'm staying here if I have to become king of the rats. <laughs> Just we'll figure it out later. Just sit down and shut up. I need to see how she is. Moses pulls Pharaoh down onto the adjacent seat but Belle doesn't notice she has headphones in. Why? It's the first night of Passover every seventh year. It's my job to give Elijah's cup to someone who is worthy of carrying it, the Jewish legacy. Just because it hasn't worked yet. Because it's dumb. Doesn't mean it won't work this year. I have a feeling about this year. Who? Elijah, answer of questions, resolver of conflict, possible Messiah. Stop asking questions you already know the answer to. No. Who gets the cup and what's Passover? Subway man has slowly moved over to Bell. Hey. Excuse me? Huh? Oh, um, no thanks. She scoots away from Subway man. Oh, no, I, I just... Could you give me some space? Sorry, I, I'm... Subway man starts backing up, but the train lurches and he stumbles toward Bell. Hey, back up. I, I just tripped, sorry. You should really back up. I have mace. Calm down. Calm down? You come over here, get in my space, and you have the audacity to tell me to calm down? I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to say hi. I, I work at the farmer's market stall you come to every single week. You you've talked to me like six times about my how my cat's dying. Oh. Hi. I'm sorry, that was, sorry. How's your cat? It's fine, it, she's fine. We had to get her spleen out, but it's healing really well, and I think that, um, <laughs> um. Oh gosh, sorry, it's not Agatha's spleen. Subway man is looking at her. I keep thinking about this story. Subway man shakes his head and walks away. Belle puts in your phone back in. Hold this while I slip the cup into her back. It's full of wine. You're going to stain it. Just hand it to her. She can't see us. We're not here like that. And I need to get you back. 
oh, I can't believe this. You said we were real. Is my body still in the field? Am I lying face down? If I get sunburned, I'll cut your fingernails too short. Yeah, that's proportional retribution. We're not going to be here long enough. Just hold my clipboard. Suddenly, Subway Man turns around and walks over to Bell again. Moses freezes and listens. What story? Oh, it's pretty common. I don't know why I said it like that. You'd know it. I don't want to bore you, so. She puts her earphones back in. Hmm. Cryptic. I, I, I'm sure I don't know the story. I hate stories. There's a copy of Franny and Zoe in your pocket. Carry it for the morals. You know Salinger won't sell the rights to the audiobook? The media has to be consumed in its original form. Oh. Uh, cool. Yeah, right? Come on, I'll invade your personal space again. Sorry. I like your hair. You have a really kind face. Please tell me the story. I'm sure I haven't heard it before, at least the way you tell it. No. Why won't she tell him? Why does he care? What's special about her? This is like watching TV with a parrot. Can you please be quiet? Subway Man is still standing in front of Belle. He looks totally at peace. I'm not good at telling stories. They never come out right. I don't care. He won't move. Belle looks really uncomfortable. Um, okay, fine. Close your eyes. He does. You seriously can't look. Okay, there was a- Subway man peeks. Without looking at him, Bell says- Looking. He closes his eyes. She starts. No one knows when, but there was a shepherd and after tending his flock without water all day, he heard a voice telling him to take off his shoes and come into a cave. And he thought he was hallucinating because, you know, he was super dehydrated. This boy said he had to take off his shoes because the ground he walked on was holy ground. Um, so he did. And his reward was to see this bush on fire. Um, but the flames didn't consume the bush. They just danced along the branches. Mesmerized, he listened to the voice in his head. It said horrible things. There would be plagues, death. The voice told him he would abandon his life betray his brother. He would take up a new family and he would carry them through a canyon of waves to 40 years of suffering. And he did. And he forgot his shoes. Oh. Moses' shoes are gone. Subway man stares at Bell. You're right. I think I've heard that one. Told you. Is that about you and me? Moses doesn't move. Sorry, um, I have a question. Anything. Do you have a diary? Yes. Do you have it with you? It's in my notes app. Bell holds out her hand. Subway man hands over his phone. What's the password? Drab, crab, broccoli, rab. Okay, great. That's, thanks. Bell offers Subway man his phone. He takes it, walks away, and then turns back. You screenshotted my journal. Um. And sent it to yourself? Delete my number. How did you do that? How did you make me do that? Take off your shoes. He takes off his shoes and stands there in his socks. The train slows. Oh God, sorry, bye. Belle gets off the train. Subway man and Moses stand apart, staring after her. Hey, where are your shoes? Crap. They hurry off the train behind Belle. Moses is still shoeless. Scene three. A small New York City apartment that has been tastefully decorated by a young liberal person. All of the furnishings look vaguely Danish, except for the big chintz armchair in the left of the dining room, the massive Killam rug on the floor, the antique and imposing dining chair set. There's a classic Seder spread, wine, plates, settings, glasses, a Seder plate, and various Passover kosher appetizers threaten to buckle the little thrifted dining table. Belle bursts in on her sister Mira adjusting the table and her father Leo poking around on his phone and waving his free hand around in a gesture that's something like helping. Belle is super flustered. Bathroom. Hey, Hi, Annie. 
Bell runs into the next room. Moses and Pharaoh enter the apartment. Moses is panting. Pharaoh looks around wide-eyed. Bell and Ophir meet off stage. Ellie, sweetheart, why are all your sister's candles bent? They're gonna tip over onto her bedspread and start a house fire. Sorry, um, ask me or I have to pee. Oh Adore my God. Plans. What's in this bag? It weighs a ton. No wonder your left shoulder sits just a little bit low. Please don't touch that. I'll be out in a sec. Leo is looking at his phone. Why are your candles bent? My German friend has that candle business I told you about. They sell really well at the co-op. German friend? Please, just don't. Not in front of you know who. Moses has finally caught her breath. So when she comes back, we'll... Give her the cup, I know. I can't believe you couldn't catch up with her. I don't have any shoes. And I think I stepped on a cockroach. Can we stay? What? What do you mean, what? Once that girl gets the cup, I want to see what's in that big tower we walked past. That's a T-Mobile store. Leo and Mira have slowly stopped setting up and stare at Pharaoh and Moses. And find out how they make those big flat things light up. And also, why does everything smell gross, but also delicious? I want to eat everything, but also burn all of it. Burn everything down into a little pile of normal smelling ash. Cup. Then we leave because you shouldn't be here and I feel weird. Would you like some water? Moses doesn't notice that Leo can see her and is speaking to her, but Pharaoh does. He nudges Moses, but Moses doesn't move. It's as if Pharaoh didn't touch her at all. Hey, he can see us. I thought they couldn't see us. Don't worry, just queasy. Oh, we have Pepto. I get stomach stuff all the time. <laughs> just can't give up cheese. Oh, Ophir? I am your grandmother. You will call me grandma or you will call me nothing. I am blowing out your candles. Oh my God. Sorry, give me a sec. Mira marches off. Moses mutters to Pharaoh, but mostly to herself. She can see me and she is getting me Pepto. Obviously. Well, yes, son. Why wouldn't she see you? Did he call me son? You're just everyone's son now. Prodigy. Gotta go. Huh. Great word. Sit, please, I insist. Any guest of Bell's, not that we've had occasions to meet the boyfriend before, but hey, on Passover? Cool. You must be pretty religious. This man thinks I am a boy and a real person. Moses slowly sits on the ground. Wait. <laughs> this is amazing. You look terrible, and your plan is screwed. Pharaoh turns to Leo. Maybe you guys can keep me. I think we'll really see eye to eye, because you're right. Moses is super religious, but not in a fun way. Be really careful about getting reeled in by Aura, because one minute it's all, oh, there's going to be all these plague murders, which sounds crazy to a normal person. But turns out, Moses' words. Hey, intimidation is totally normal when you meet the dad, but I just want you to know, you can call me Leo. He offers Moses his fist to bump. Moses just looks at it. Pharaoh deflates. Should have known. Mira runs in with a pink bottle. Got the Pepto. Oh, no, you look bad. My, my mom said to put your head between your knees when you're queasy. Mira makes her way over to Moses and reaches out to hand her the bottle, but Moses yells. You can't touch me! Um, I have psoriasis. Like, like really bad psoriasis. What are you doing? I'm not sure what would happen if you touched me in the skin, um, but thank you. Moses gingerly tries to drink the Pepto, but it spills all over her leg and on the rug. Oh, okay, on the rug. Cool. Dad, could you get the blue dish towel, not, not the one with the embroidery? Listen, man, I know a dermatologist. Oh, no, wait. Let me call my dealer. Leo pulls out his phone and starts pacing in the background. It's just weed. Ophir! Grandma! Ophir enters carrying a candle. In the same moment, Pharaoh makes his way over to an armchair where he sits, feet off the ground, knees curled up. Made in Germany. Really? <sighs> um... 
Grandma, we have a guest. You and your sister are the juiciest gala apples of my eye. And yet I have no idea what's going through your heads. Ever. Belle brought a bag full of oranges, tofu, and a dog toy. Is she on a cleanse? I don't know. Grab me the casual dish towel, please. Why don't you grab it so I can say hello? Or are you afraid I'll say something insensitive? God, I'll get it then. You do this every... Mira disappears around the wall that sits behind the dining table leading to the kitchen. I'm going to become this chair. No, I need you. Hmm. You remind me of my best friend. She was very forthright with all the people in her life. I think that's why she got divorced so many times. You can laugh, that was a joke. <laughs> I'm having a weird day. And, and there's something I really need to give to- Are Mira you going Ray. to propose? Listen to me. Ophir tries to grab Moses's wrist and Moses scoots back as fast as she can, hitting the wall. Unless you're one of those birth writers, you are way too young to get married. And skittish. Bell would scare you to death. Pharaoh speaks from the chair. Moses can't die. Myths can't die. Bell re-enters, reaching for her bag. Thank you, Grammy, but I really need my... Bell sees Moses. I love this chair. I am in love with this chair. Bad luck. He's off the night. Where did my nice towel go? Did you... Follow me? You. Sorry, it's just... No, it has to be you. Listen to me, my grandbaby. I know you may love her, but before she proposes, at least think about the consequences. Do you want to be married in Maine with hiking boots for friends and an elderly cat for a baby? That is so offensive. And why didn't you tell me you were engaged? Your what? Is my daughter pregnant? Moses tries to compose herself. No one is anything to anyone. Except me. I'm this chair. It's my throne and I'm its king. Well, like, what are you doing here? Ellie, sweetheart, we can talk this out. But I'm going to call the cops. Dad, put the phone down. We have talked about this so many times. The police only serve to escalate bad situations. And this clearly will not be made any better with idiots with firearms. Have you all forgotten that I own this apartment? Have I been reduced to a set dressing? I have. That wasn't really a straight answer. I won't give you a line. I'm sorry, I never make jokes. I don't know why I said that. You're a person and I have boundaries. Please leave. Hey, my sister doesn't know you, so you need to get out of my home, okay? Her home that I own. Mir, I can handle this. I'm just trying to help. Hi, hello. I'd like to report a... Mira grabs the phone and hangs it up. You couldn't ask? Hey, Dad, hang up the phone. <sighs> Might have to sit down to recover from this massive effort. Could have listened this time? No, Leo, no one around here asked anything. May I bring a guest? May I carry my phone around like an oxygen tank? May I arrive late? May I cook everything and not let anyone else bring anything? For example, the Haro set, which they have been making every Passover for 30 years, but let someone bring the cedar plate alternatives for the new millennium? Belle is allergic to walnuts, and what's in that classic Haro set? Walnuts. walnuts. Can we address the family drama once this person explains what's happening? Listen. I'm not accusing you of anything, but it really seems like you followed me. I was worried your cat was having spleen trouble because I overheard you talking to your friend. Uh, did he recover his passcode? So your boyfriend is coming? An understanding passes between Belle and Moses. They both become extra cordial. Oh, well, gosh, that's so nice of you, but you must have misunderstood. It was his cat <laughs> well gosh silly of me i guess i'll just give you this instead moses looks around for the cup but ophir has picked it up someone left wine on the floor dad is that the cup mom always talked about leo's back in his phone uh -huh. beautiful as ophir speaks moses tries to inch toward her to get the cup Yes. 
Your grandfather bought it for me as a wedding present. At the end of the service, when he wrapped up the wine glass and crushed it under his foot, I started to cry. I never cried like that before, but I just knew those pieces would never be like they were before. But Saul wiped a tear from my face and told me to meet him in front of the temple in 20 minutes. So we slipped away, got in the car, drove across the town to our new home. And all the cabinets were bare except for one, and this cup was inside. I don't know how he knew. He knew me so well. I never asked him. Moses is unsuccessful. Grandma, I don't think that's true. It's true to me. Mom said we found it at the flea market in Brooklyn. It came from an old woman in Belarus. As Mira speaks, Moses slowly makes her way to the chair where Pharaoh is still curled up. She gave everything up for that cup when she fled the pogroms as a child. Her parents sent her away holding the cup and a few blankets. She cared for it like a baby. She trekked through Eastern Europe. She kept it safe when she went into hiding in Austria during World War II. Although she was a very beautiful woman. She never married because she and the cup became so close. She would whisper her secrets onto the rim and they'd sink into the metal. One day, a man saw her at the market and he proposed on the spot. <laughs> he was sailing for America in a few days and having nothing to leave behind, she went with him. By the time they arrived at Ellis Island, she was alone again. The man was gone and she and the cup were alone again. He left her everything, including a brown stone by the park. She lived to be 108. When she died, they gave everything to the local flea market. No one lives to be 108. The cup has been in our family since we lived in Hungary. It was stolen, but we got it back. But aren't we Romanian? Everyone but Moses and Pharaoh are looking at the cup. Bell seems skeptical. Help. I can't, I'm a chair. You're in their debt. Just give her the cup and leave me here. I can't touch them. I don't know what will happen if I do. There's been a huge mistake and they shouldn't be able to see me, but they can't see you so you can fix it. Please, you have to fix it. Get her to take the cup. They can't see me, can't hear me, I'm nothing but furniture. Please just figure this out while I make sure the world isn't going to implode. Don't make me throw up on you. My upholstery. Belle tears her gaze away from the cup. She addresses Moses. What did you do? Nothing! <laughs> you have to fix it, please. You should go. Belle moves toward Moses. Moses starts backing toward the door. Please, I have to convince my brother to help, to give you the- You're alone. No one is. Fix this. You owe us. Moses is out the door and Belle locks it. The family looks around. Belle is panting. Where's your boyfriend, honey? Belle goes to her bag, takes out an orange, and slams it onto the Seder plate. Okay, let's use this as Elijah's cup. Does anyone know what kind of wine this is? Um, Screaming Eagle Cabernet 1990. From my wedding. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call Eric back, see if he has some indica. He exits. Bell, glasses, Grammy, please put the candles back in my room. My room. Bell and Ophir set off to attend to their tasks. For a moment, the room is still. Then Pharaoh stands, stretches, and cracks various body parts. Mm. Thanks, boss. Pharaoh stoops and tries to pull the chair toward the door. It doesn't budge. He goes around the other side of the chair and tries to push it. No luck. He kicks the chair. Oh. He marches over to the door and tries to turn the handle. It doesn't budge. Oh, God. End of act one. And that is act one of Fifth Cup, everybody. So, first of all, I'd just like to thank that incredibly talented cast for treating us to a lively
performance. Uh, it must have been really challenging not being in person, but this is the first time I've seen a play since the pandemic began. So this is really exciting for me. Uh, India, incredible job writing this play, incredible job producing it, directing it. Um, I'm going to allow the audience uh, some time to enter their questions into the chat box. But I, I'd like to start with a question. The writing process, I'd like to just touch upon that, get into that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. When, and this actually question came through e, uh, an email that I received later, earlier today, excuse me. When you were writing, did you hear the words first or was it more pen to paper? Were you writing or were you listening? That's a very interesting question. Um, I think it's sort of a combination. Um, there are some things I think, especially when uh, writing about something like this, where uh, I've been pretty steeped in the Jewish community since I was really young, there are a lot of things and sort of um, idioms and ways that people speak to each other that sort of exist in my head already. Um, so I found that sometimes I would come to the script like with an idea that I really wanted to explore or this was a piece that very much came out of uh, a sort of more academic line of questioning but then I think there were also just some points like uh, that last monologue that Mira has where she's describing sort of um, this fake story of like someone in the old country who you know like carried this precious artifact with them across the ocean and all these magical things happened like those kinds of stories are very much a part of the Jewish tradition, I feel like. And um, you often get this sort of like clipped style and random details thrown in. And that one sort of, I heard in my head as I was writing it, really didn't have to go back and edit. So a combination of both. Interesting. So I, I have another question. This is more about content. And you talked about this a little bit a moment ago about the Jewish tradition and the language, the culture, the stories. And it seems that to me at least, in American letters, there's this oversized tradition of Jewish authors, especially post-World War II. And your play, I think, falls within that, that lineage. I would say so. Um, what might you attribute that to? Uh, the, the sort of, uh, the overall trend or my own dabbling in post -war? Uh Both. Yeah. Yeah, both. Why? I mean, I, I'm just thinking of and, and the Jewish literary tradition, American literature. It, it's across yeah. the spectrum. There's very dark. There's comedic. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking of novelists, with Philip Roth, Henry oh, Roth, yeah. Saul Bellow. All the classics. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that I think a lot of it has to do with, um, I mean, the Jewish storytelling tradition, from what I understand of it, it is vast and sort of unknowably deep, but the way it uh the way that Jewish folktales kind of serve their purpose in um the old country as we'll call mm -hmm. it like pre-World War One and World War II um in Eastern Europe predominantly but also in like Russia and across uh, across the world really but predominantly in that part of the world those stories that were told were short really clipped stories of like morality. Um, so I actually own this big, oh, I wish I had it with me. This this big stack of uh, Jewish, like Yiddish short stories that came from the old country. And they're divided into, basically they're all morality tales or um, like uh, legends that sort of seek to serve a moral purpose. So we have like stories that serve Jewish moral law, stories that talk about marriage, stories that talk about like dibbics or spirits or ghosts and stuff like that. So stories used to serve as lessons more so than they mm -hmm. served as explorations of a thought process or of people. And I think my take on why post-World War II there is such a huge proliferation of like Jewish dramatic work and literature is because uh, the Holocaust had a really devastating impact mm -hmm. twofold in that we lost many, many Jewish people, but um, the diaspora of Jewish culture sort of exploded in a way um, and people found themselves sort of without 
a tie to wherever their family initially came from. And I think what people work out in these plays, or at least what I feel like I wanted to work out is this connection to Jewish identity when you can no longer house your identity in a place. When you have been displaced, you sort of seek to go back and look into yourself and your family and traditions that you no longer feel directly connected to. So I think that's where a lot of mm. my impetus for this story came about because um, not only is like the history of Jewish storytelling really rich, but I feel like it's it has changed a lot and I don't really know what it looks like in the modern day. Um, so yeah, I would say that's that's my take on. Interesting, so it's simultaneously building upon tradition and then creating yes. new ones in a, in a creative exactly. fictional or dramatic way. Exactly, and uh, very much sort of exploring a history that you cannot see anymore, uh, exploring a history that is mm. for all intents and purposes lost. Right, oh, that's interesting. In the diaspora. Right, so speaking of tradition, we had a question just come through the chat box about Seder. Uh, how much was this play drawn from your own experience growing up or how was it not drawn from your own experience? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, well, this family, I think, echoes mine in a little, in a small way. I, I am an older sister and have a younger sister. Uh, hi, Paisley. Um, but uh, I think also, uh, I don't know, it seems common to me to meet Jewish families with like two kids. Um, I don't know why that is, but especially in my own community growing up, that's kind of just what I saw. So that's initially what I sort of sought to write. And then definitely no ghosts or spirits of uh, figures from the Torah in my own life. But um, I think a lot of the questions that I'm sort of exploring in this piece occur to me all the time. Like one big thing that I think about a lot is the generational uh, divide in thinking in the Jewish community. And I think it's present mm. anywhere, but um, uh, like Ophir has a very different idea about what it means to be friends with a German person than her granddaughter does. And um, Leo has very specific ideas about what relationships look like as opposed to his children and his own uh, mother. So I, I often find myself thinking about sort of intergenerational questions, um, but I would say the most direct reflection of this uh, play in my own life is the relationship between the sisters in it. Okay. Um, so here's a question about some of the characters in the play. So historically, um, in the Jewish tradition, the biblical tradition, the Pharaoh is a villain. But in your play, he's almost, he's a comic figure. Mm -hmm. So what prompted you to recast the Pharaoh in this light? Thanks, Anastasia, for that question. I, I'm really happy someone asked because it was kind of, I think when I when I decided how I wanted Pharaoh to exist in this play is kind of when it opened up a little bit more. Um, I think there is this notion in the Jewish community, or at least this notion I've found myself with, that history is we the way in which the Jewish community understands our own history is permanent. And the way that we see, the way that we look back on the stories in the Torah and the stories of our ancestors, that's exactly how it happened. Um, we know exactly who everyone is. We know exactly how everyone is, the way that they feel and think and approach the world. Um, and like classically in Jewish text, Pharaoh is absolutely a villain, but um, the, I was listening to a podcast, I genuinely can't remember which one it was, a few months ago because I listened to so many podcasts, but they were talking about Passover and the tradition of the Haggadah, which is the prayer book that you use during Passover to guide you through the service. And to me, the Haggadah is this, it's like the Torah, at least until I came to this podcast, I was like, oh, this has existed forever. That's the only way we could do Passover. You have to have a like a Haggadah or else you can't do the Passover service. 
Um, and I was listening to this podcast and they said, yeah, you know, Haggadot came about in the 1930s. And it kind of blew my mind. I was very confused. I asked my dad, he was like, I don't know. Um, and that really struck me because I feel like there are so many aspects of Jewish storytelling and culture that I just don't question that I sort of approach as fact. Um, and Pharaoh is this very factually villainous person within the Passover narrative, especially like we have songs about it. Um, but I thought it would be interesting because we don't see, we don't see Pharaoh do anything really in the Torah. I've reread that text multiple times and he's not an active figure. Uh, people react to him. Moses is a very active figure in the Torah, parts the sea, leads the Israelites to safety. But um, Pharaoh doesn't really have a say nor does Pharaoh get to uh, explain his reasoning or sort of, we don't see what happens to him after Moses leaves either with the Israelites. They just sort of leave. And I guess we assume that Pharaoh and everyone perishes in hellfire or something. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought it would be interesting to sort of explore what it looked like if Pharaoh had been sort of endlessly punished and to see what he, how he feels about Moses, his adopted brother, and how he would react if he were asked to face up to his own crimes and his own uh, role in history. Um, and I thought it would be fun if he was sort of a doof. And that's why I wrote him that way. All right. Um, so quite... You mentioned Moses, and at the beginning, you, you noted that Moses is gender neutral in this play. Yes. Um, now, I don't, and what, why'd you decide to do that? Why'd you decide to play with the gender identity of one of the key characters, in, not only in the Jewish tradition, but in the Christian tradition and in the larger, in larger Western culture? Absolutely. Um, I wish I had a more academic answer for this, but um, I guess I'll say that I, I'm taking the Hamilton approach, which is that I feel like in a dramatic space, uh, it's, it's my job to make space for anyone and everyone to come to a piece and to have Pharaoh's race and gender ref be reflective of what exists in the Bible and the Torah as sort of a fundamental text, um, I don't think is fair to actors. And if there is a cisgendered white male who comes to this piece and like absolutely knocks it out of the park, that's great. But um, I just know too many talented non-cis, non-white people to not make space for them in this piece. And I also think that uh, Moses as a sort of morally erect figure in this play, I don't necessarily associate that with a lot of powerful white men in culture today. Um, so I, I, again, just wanted to make space, especially for a figure who I have a lot of uh, respect and um, yeah, who I have respect for to make space for that to not just be played by someone who reflects exactly what's written in the text that was written thousands of years ago. And do you see this non-traditional casting? Do you see uh, a hunger for it? In, and actors and playwrights and directors to, to present us with characters and stories in fresh novel ways. Absolutely. I think, um, especially after the pandemic, um, when the industry sort of stopped mm -hmm. for a while, um, people really took time and took stock of what they think is important mm -hmm. and uh, worthy of amplification in a dramatic way. <laughs> And I think to a lot of people that includes narratives that we haven't seen a lot of in a dramatic space. So narratives that include people of differing genders, sexualities, races, classes, sizes. Um, and I can speak as an actor on this also on like any website you check, um, you can see that the casting breakdowns are far more diverse than they used to be, which I think is really wonderful. That's great. That's a welcome trend. 
So we only have time for a few more questions. Uh, one question coming in about the play, how much is finished? <laughs> and can we look forward to reading a full version at some point? I would love to finish this mm -hmm. piece. I think um, as well as it works over Zoom, uh, I have a lot of ideas about what it would look like physically. And I think I'm a person that really enjoys sound and movement in pieces of dramatic work because the text is, I think, 25% maybe. And okay. the actors bring so much to this, but I think having a live version would be super helpful, especially in setting tone and all that jazz. Um, I have some pieces of later scenes written, so I would love to finish this. Act one is the most polished part, and that's kind of why I wanted to show it to you all. But um, I also didn't want to finish this quite yet because I was hoping that any of the people watching today who want to give me feedback or want to talk to me about this piece can absolutely do that. And I'm sure that would influence the way I finish it. Um, but yeah, if I can find a space and a cast and a chunk of time and the will to finish this piece, mm -hmm. I would love to finish it and I would love to mount it at some point. So you're an actor, you're a writer, and I'd just like to ask you, I'd just like to ask you to put on your acting hat for a moment. While I was watching the play, what really uh, struck me was the, the physical acting of the actors, their facial expressions, their movements that if I was watching a traditional stage play, unless I was at the front row, that might be invisible to me. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 was, I was just really drawn to that throughout the performance, just really watching how they, their, their eyes, their mouths, their, their body was moving. Um, do you see plays continuing on Zoom because of this? Or do you see it, it, it's allowing actors to perform in a different way, to tap into different talents, different skills? Or do you just think we need to go back to the stage and that's where plays deserve to be, they need to be? I mean, it's a tough question. And if any of the actors want to speak on that, you can drop and like a little waving your hand emoji and I'll give you the floor. Oh, uh, um, it looks like a few, ooh. Mira. Eliza and, oh, and Angelica. Yeah. Uh, Eliza, you go ahead and then Angelica follow up. Hi, I moved. Um, <laughs> I've done a lot of Zoom acting over the past year and I will say it's like a lot, it's a lot different and you very much is the same with film. You learn your Zoom angles mm -hmm. as it were and uh, how to, how to, you know, bring it down into the box so that you're not overpowering and you're also just picking up on subtle things. I would say from the actor's perspective, it's definitely helped me think about my art more filmically and how that transfers. I would not like to keep doing Zoom plays, um, <laughs> not because they're not fun and it's not great to see uh, really, you know, subtle facial gestures and get intimate with your audience, but because I really miss theater and I think it is coming back and I'm really excited for it. But I think um, from an educational perspective, it's really helped me think about, do I want to go into film? Because does it work, you know, how, how have I worked on Zoom and how do I like the, just the littleness of it all? So, mm -hmm. you know, that's how it transfers, I think. I agree. And uh, Angelica. I um, <clears throat> still have my hand up, would like to acknowledge the accessibility of Zoom to many people who cannot otherwise afford physically attend um, or who mentally do not have the space to attend theater. And for that, I think that Zoom plays are very useful. Additionally, I think Zoom plays are very useful in the beginning stages, such as a reading something where everybody's sitting down at the table because it really um, shows an appreciation for the actors, for the directors, for the designers is time that they don't have to transport to a location, transport back when a lot of actors are additionally working multiple jobs to support themselves at the beginning of their careers um, and at the end of their careers even. So I would just like to do a, a thumbs up Zoom for accessibility. Um, and that's about it, but it is a very, is a very key point. <laughs> Angelica, that's really important. I completely agree. I think they said it all.
All right, so uh, we are almost out of time. Final question. You are part of the first Duffy Fellows. Could you just share your experience with us? Yeah, absolutely. I think as quickly as I possibly can. Um, I am so, so grateful to have been a part of this cohort. It was a rough year for theater folk. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure I don't have to tell you why, but um, couldn't do anything in person, anywhere, and no one really knew what was going to become of theater. Um, and to have sort of the space and time uh, that not only the, the generous financial aspect of this grant afforded me, but also the space and time afforded to me by David Goodwin and David Gibson and by the other uh, fellows and by just sort of having a name, like a title to put to this. I was like, mm. can't do that working on my grant. Can't call you working on my grant. Um, to be afforded that space and time was really, um, I think, indescribably precious to me because I don't know, I don't know if I would have given this project the sort of time and energy that it needed had someone else not affirmed that I could do that. So uh, two thumbs up for the Duffy Fellowship. It's a wonderful way to end our conversation and our performance tonight. Um, just some final thoughts. Again, many thanks to India and the entire cast of Fifth Cup for the gift of live theater this evening. I think it's something many of us needed after a long, difficult year. A big thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. As noted, the video of this performance will be posted on our YouTube channel in the coming days, so keep an eye out for that. Next Wednesday, June 16th, 2021, at noon, we'll be hosting our next and final Duffy Fellows event for the year, Power in the Cross with Carlos Arbegoso Barrios. Take care, everyone, and we hope to see you next week. <laughs>